All right. So again, welcome everyone uh, to our Learning Aligned Employment Program Information Session. Uh, this one is specific to our on-campus employers. Um, and we have here our LAEP um, team that's made up of folks from both the Career Center and Financial Aid. So um, I'll quickly introduce myself and pass it over to my colleagues. Um, so I'm Michelle S. Gomez. Um, you probably have gotten emails either from myself or the other Michelle Gomez, um, but I work in the Career Center. Um, I support um, our employers on campus in general with recruitment efforts um, and support with Handshake inquiries. Handshake is our main platform for job postings. So, um, you know, as well as just uh, as a as a, a resource uh, for information on the program. So. I'll pass it over to the other Michelle. Yeah, probably nice to kind of get that cleared up right at the beginning, right? So um, I'm the second Michelle Gomez. So I'm Michelle M. Gomez, and I am in the financial aid office. So I am the special programs officer. And one of the special programs that I oversee is the Learning Aligned Employment Program. So I work on this program a little bit more on the student eligibility uh, documentation and onboarding side of the house. So um, I also hope here to service a resource for folks going through the process um, and having questions on any of those items. Um, but with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to uh, Monica from our office as well. Thank you, Michelle. Hi everyone, my name is Monica Martinez Daniels and I work in the financial aid office, but also supporting the late program and some of the more behind the scenes work I've been happy to have you all here. Welcome. All right. So with that being said, let's go ahead and uh, dig into some LEAP information or Learning Aligned Employment Program. That's kind of shorthand what we call it, LEAP. Um, so in order to start kind of conceptualizing this program, we want to think about it as a new type of work study program coming from the state. So really here at UC Riverside, we're starting to think about work study as more of an umbrella term to encompass uh, the two types of programs that we currently have. So the first, maybe some folks are already familiar with in the room, and that's the federal work study program coming from the federal government. And the second now is the Learning and Mind Employment Program or LAEP, which is a state financial aid program. So it comes from the folks um, at the California Student Aid Commission, the same folks who do uh, the Cal Grant program, if you're familiar with that. So there's two different types of work city programs. And while they do marry each other in a lot of respects, and we'll kind of go over some of those similarities, um, there are some differences as well. And we hope to kind of highlight what those are, just so you all can start thinking about maybe what program best suits your department's needs. Um, so first off with the federal work study program, as I mentioned, it's a federal um, financial aid program. And in this particular program, um, there's a wide range of the different types of student employment roles um, or, or jobs, positions that folks can uh, be employed in. So these would be even jobs that are more uh, administrative or clerical in nature, let's say, to help an organization or a department. Um, whereas with LAEP, we see what um, a big distinction is with the program is for our on-campus employers, at least, there needs to be a research-based component to the role in order to participate in the learning line of program employment program. That's going to be one of the big focal points for our on-campus employers for sure. So to dig into what the actual late or learning aligned employment program is, is it is a financial aid program that provides funding to employers to be able to offer um, for at least on-campus employers research-based opportunities um, that will at the end of the day also help a student um, earn funds to offset their educational costs. Now, as a whole, although we'll be focusing on our on-campus employers, there are a couple other types of organizations that we can partner with to provide students with these employment aligned or learning aligned, I should say, opportunities. So the first bullet point on here really talks about our on-campus departments, our on-campus employers that are providing those research opportunities. But we can also partner with um, public school districts and public schools, um, as well as off-campus organizations, whether they be for-profit or non-profit. Um, as long as they're non-sectarian and non-political in nature um, with the type of work that they're having a student perform. And in addition for those folks, um, they also have to meet a requirement that they're able to either provide a student full-time employment after they have finished in their role or after they have graduated, I should say, or be able to connect with an employer who is similarly able to do so. So this is really what our employers are, are looking like at this point in time. We'll dig into employer eligibility um, for our on-campus employers in a bit more depth in a second. 
Before that though, we're gonna just go ahead and wrap up some of the big um, characteristics as far as the Learning and Line Employment Program. Um, first and foremost, as I mentioned, it is a new state financial aid program. And this is gonna be for research-based positions only if you're an on-campus department. One thing that we haven't mentioned quite yet, and we'll go into a bit of the financials a little bit later in this webinar, is that the uh, cost share for LEAP is uh, a bit unique for our on-campus employers in that it, it fully funds those on-campus positions up to a student's allocation for the program. Um, and like I said, more details to come on that, um, but that's something big for this particular program. Uh, second to last on here, if a student is work study eligible, it's likely that they're late eligible. They have a lot of the same um, overlap with some of their program requirements. Um, so that's a good first thing to kind of take a look at when you are attempting to employ a student. And lastly, because this is a type of work study program, students do not need to repay these funds back in any way, shape or form. They're earning these funds essentially as they are working in these different types of positions. All right, so shifting back our attention to the employer eligibility and specifically employer eligibility for our on-campus departments. Uh, the good news is, is that any on-campus college or department already qualifies to be a LAPE employer uh, for being here at UCR. So there isn't any sort of additional paperwork process that's needed to register the site itself. There's definitely some documentation as far as the student is concerned um, and, and being set up for LAPE, but there's nothing additional that the site needs to do itself to be able to qualify. Um, secondly on here, when we talk about these jobs needing to have that research component, the way that we're defining research positions is essentially positions where students do have direct opportunities to participate in research, whether that's academic or scientific, either by conducting that research themselves or um, being able to assist a, a research supervisor or mentor in those tasks. Now, these research positions, they, they have to be yes, strongly research-based. They can still have administrative or clerical responsibilities associated with the role, um, but at least 51% or more of the role should be research-based is kind of what we're looking at when we're reviewing um, job descriptions that are kind of going to be more described in the future. And lastly, the research needs to be directed either by um, a staff member or a, a research member who will determine what those research requirements or outcomes should be. Now here on this next slide, we do have some examples of um, what would be considered a, a research-based um, job description or duty, I should say. So just to read off a couple of these, um, one can be just researching and collecting data through complex techniques and procedures, library research, or pro project-specific methodology. Um, a student can also be using computer applications online um, for or doing a literature review search. These are just kind of some of the things that we'll be taking a look at to see if it fits that research-based requirement as we're reviewing those job descriptions. Um, of course, um, if your location does perform um, or, or have research opportunities for students, it's likely that it's already filling, uh, fitting the bill and not needing to kind of utilize any of these, but these are just some examples of what could be. And then shifting over to student eligibility, at the moment, the Learning Aligned Employment Program is for undergraduate students only. Um, and since it is a type of financial aid program, students do need to demonstrate financial need in order to participate in the program. So uh, one of the ways in which they showcase this is by being already work study eligible. This is going to be based on the results of their FAFSA application or the California Dream Act application. A couple ways in which a student um, or folks that are trying to employ students can see if a student is already work study eligible is by either having a student review their financial aid award offer or pulling up their work study eligibility notification, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later in this presentation as well. But essentially, there's some quick ways that students and employers can see if they already may be eligible for LEAP as well. Um, as students are participating in LAPE and serving their hours, they do need to be continuously enrolled at least half time, so at least six units in order to remain eligible for, for those funds. And students do need to be California residents to be considered for the program. We're also maintaining satisfactory academic progress. We also call it SAP in our department as well. And they need to have eligibility to work in the United States. We mentioned this a little bit more specifically because um, while we realize that California DREAM Act applicants may be eligible for this program, they do also need to be authorized to work in the US in order to participate since it's an employment-based program. 
And so th these would be our students as an example that qualify under DACA, which is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or also provided that work authorization as a result. Lastly, as far as student eligibility though, since this is a learning aligned employment program um, and we're trying to have positions that are essentially helping students in the future align with their future career path, career goals, or career exploration even, the students will need to self-certify um, through their documentation process that the position that they're applying for and have received does align with um, their, their future career goals. So with that being said, that's kind of an overview on the program, what student eligibility, eligibility looks like, employer eligibility as well. I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Michelle from the Career Center to talk about what the hiring process looks like. All right. Okay, so um, speaking to the hiring process, so if, you know, you are um, wanting to participate in the program and get started, um, it actually, uh, this is a quick um, process map that kind of shows you what the process includes. So um, it starts with posting your job on Handshake. So that is true whether um, you need to do a re open recruitment for a student or if you already have a student in mind. Um, we'll get into the details about that, but um, it starts with that posting and that is again due to a state you know, regulations to make sure that we have that documented. Um, then it starts with the interview process. Um, again, if you have not already selected who your candidate will be, um, then there, the onboarding piece is really important. So I know um, we usually will work with, you know, both the hiring managers, but often we are working maybe with an admin um, that might also be supporting on the back end with hiring and uh, the onboarding piece. So there's definitely some important details there to note and that we are connected to both. Um, and then we have some important details about the employment timeline as well as the supervisor's responsibilities in managing those hours. So starting with uh, the posting and handshake. So um, there's just slightly different steps if you are, again, going to need to do an open recruitment versus you already have a student in mind. Um, if you need to do an open recruitment, again, you'll start on Handshake. Um, we know that some folks um, are already on Handshake. You might have someone in your department that already has an account. Then some of you may not. Um, something to note with Handshake, we do kind of a um, a department level model where um, as opposed to kind of all of you being under the UCR company account, um, the company will be your department. So, you know, UCR um, Center for Undergraduate Research, you know, would be your company account. Um, and every company has the, an owner of that account. So if you are needing to set up a new account, um, you would be creating um there are steps here that it show you how to create that new employer account. Um, and then the owner of that account needs to actually approve you as a new user in Handshake. So again, if there's any, if you're like, I have no clue if we one have a Handshake account or you don't know who the owner would be, that's where you can reach out to us at the Career Center. We are happy to kind of look into that for you and make sure we can get you through that process. Um, so that is kind of step number one. Um, and then again, you'll need to post your job. So if you have a student already in mind, um, the only difference between what I just described is in your job description in the title, you're gonna add reserved um, into the title. So it's a reserved work study slash LAP. Um, that's gonna cue our team to not let that posting go live. Instead, uh, we would approve it and immediately expire it. Um, so then you have, the job description in your account, it's been posted, but it's not live to students. Um, so we'll get into the job description details. So what needs to be included? Um, so LAEP is a little bit more robust in terms of their checklist than uh, federal work study. So if you have participated, um, we thank you for your patience as I know it's a little bit of a learning curve. Um, uh, but based the, some of the basic details are included here. So um, in the title, 
all you need to include is work study um, slash LAPE and then whatever the title is of your position. Um, then uh, we will go ahead and add the classification so you don't need to worry about that. Obviously, what department they will be employed with, the location, will it be in office, virtual or hybrid? And again, there's places in the form where all of this information will be required anyways. Um, this is an important piece that's not in the form is student supervisor. And that's something that the um, is required by the Lake program. So make sure including that in your job description, who the student will be reporting to, the length of their employment date. So um, and making sure that those align within the late timeline. Um, so if you planned on the student working into the summer, we would have to adjust just for the posting state, uh, the posting um, within those timelines, but you can always add those details into the, the job description itself. Um, what is the purpose of the project? How does it relate to the whole department? And I'll show you some samples so you can see what that looks like. Um, and obviously what are gonna be the duties? That's how we're gonna assess whether it meets that 51% or more research thresh threshold. Um, and then what is the rate of pay for the position? So um, if it is one rate of pay, there it's pretty simple, but if you think that you're gonna put a pay range, there is um, some specific qualifications you need to include. And I'll show you a sample as well on that. And then if there will be any evaluation procedures, then that should be included as well. We have a guide that we've made for you guys that has kind of sample research statements, um, has a breakdown of all of the, the full kind of job uh, form so you can kind of see what to put where, as well as some sample job descriptions. So I encourage you, um, and when you'll all get a copy of this slide deck, it's on our website. Um, I encourage you to utilize that when you get to this step. Um, this is just to visualize a couple of places to make note of. So in the job form, again, this would be a sample of what kind of that title would look like. You would just be adding work study LAP and then the title of the position and the department. Um, it's always under on-campus student employment. Again, we'll make those edits on the back end if you just forget and put it under a different category. Um, and then uh, LAPE is actually going to be included with those federal work study jobs. So you would select yes um, here on is it a work study job? Because um, again, um, those are the students that they have exclusive access to be able to view this position um, in Handshake. Um, and then for these application expiration dates, making sure that it aligns within the, the LAPE timeline, which we'll share again in a moment. Um, and then in the job description, again, using that checklist, make sure this is where you can really, we want to see a little bit more of a robust job description. Don't, you know, give me just one little couple sentences. I will, we will be asking for more information um, and just making sure that, again, the supervisors included the purpose of the role. And then if there is um, a range in that pay, um, Something that we also see, um, Handshake um, gives you the ability to, um, there's a few different options, but you would want to select custom range here. Um, if you wanted to, um, I'm realizing my slide here is a little kooky. So $16 is the new minimum wage. <laughs> FYI, don't put $15.50. Um, but um, if it was just a set rate, you could do 16 to 16 per hour. Um, and then that would be fine. But if you said, let's just say 16 to 18 an hour, um, this is a sample here of language you may want to include in your job description. Because again, LAPE is going to want to see, okay, why would you pay a student 16 versus 18? What are those qualifications? All right, so just briefly on interviewing, um, we know all of you, you have your process for interviewing. Um, we just have some resources here as best practices, um, but a couple things to note um, as you are going through that process. Um, students um, should not be working more than 19 hours a week. That's kind of a student employment guideline campus-wide. 
So they may have other on-campus um, jobs. So that's always an important thing to ask in the interview. Um, and if they do, it is possible that they can do LAPE as well, but just making sure they're within that 19 hours threshold. And then if that other job is a work study job, just also note that they would be sharing that award um, between both of the departments and it will deplete that award that much faster. So again, these are just important things to make note of in the, the interview process, depending on what your needs are. And then we also recommend that students submit their work study eligibility notification, which looks um, something like this um, to you in that interview, just as proof of their eligibility. So again, it would be, it's similar to the federal work study program, um, but uh, it will be for late. And I will pass it over to my colleagues to speak on the onboarding process. All right. So let's say you're at the stage um, or you have a supervisor that's at the stage where they have already selected a student that they want to participate in the late program. They posted a handshake, gotten that approved, maybe done the interviewing. The next step is to think about what the student onboarding process looks like. And that's really going to be initiated by the student going ahead and completing the work study new hire form. So for folks who are maybe familiar with federal work study, uh, you might already be familiar with this form, but essentially it is a form either on our website or the Career Center's website, you can access it from there as well, um, that the student will complete to start to provide us information about the student, um, who their supervisor is, um, and it's a Microsoft form that will essentially then route a DocuSign with the late student employment contract for the student and supervisor to sign. We'll see that here on the next slide, but before we go ahead and do that, on the Work City New Hire form, there's a couple of questions we'd like to highlight um, just to make sure that students are receiving the correct student employment contract um, and in the correct format. So the first question on here is on the, the right hand side, there's a screenshot as well. It's which program are you participating in? Since we have those two Work City programs, you'll want to make sure to select or have the student select, I should say, the Learning Aligned Employment Program. Um, just because there's two separate contracts. Um, and then the second question that we'd like to highlight is, do you have a copy of the job posting from Handshake? And it's asking the student that, right? So if the student answers yes, that they do have a copy of that job posting, when that contract is routed to them, it'll ask them to upload it. If they select no instead, when the supervisor gets the contract, it'll instead ask them to, to upload it instead of the student. So those are kind of gonna be two of the, the more important questions on there, just to make sure that the formatting on that contract is correct. Um, so on the next slide, we can go ahead and take a look at that. All right, perfect. So um, this is a couple screenshots of what the late student employment contract looks like. And again, this comes from the student filling out the work study new hire form, routing to the student first, the student signs, and then it goes to the supervisor. So this LAPE contract covers essentially the program's conditions um, and student-specific information. So this is what we'll see the student's pay rate, as an example, be listed on there, their supervisor, uh, program requirements that they have to continue to meet, um, and other notes about the program. It's on this LAPE contract as well, where the student will be prompted to submit their work study eligibility notification that they can receive at the, the link here on the screen. Um, and it'll also ask them to self-certify how the position aligns with future career goals. Once the student attaches their work study eligibility notification, that notification will have their allocation for their program and allow the supervisor to fill in that information once it routes to them as well. In any case, whether it's the student or the supervisor doing it, it will ask for a copy of the job posting to be provided, the one from Handshake, at this time as well, just depending on the answer to the new hire form. The student said they had the copy, it will prompt them to do so. If they said that they didn't have a copy, then the supervisor will have to add it on there. And so the last part of really the onboarding process um, after the work study new hire form and the student employment contract is completed is to ensure that the student is onboarded as a student employee um, with their actual department, uh, whether you are the supervisor directly and asking your HR admin team to help you out in the process or whether you are that person and really understanding how to ensure that the late program can go ahead and cover those wages. Um, this can technically be done at the same time as the, the paperwork that we just saw on the last couple slides, 
um, or it could be done right after, just depending on what folks' preference is. At the end of the day, the student won't be able to start properly earning wages under LAID until all these items are complete. Um, and that should really be assigned to folks, you know, is the work study new hire form completed? Uh, did my late student employment contract get approved? And do I have the student um, onboarded within my department as a, a student employee, employee using the correct position pool ID, which I'll talk about here in a second. Um, so second item on here, um, another thing that supervisors may need to do with their HR admin team is to just consult um, as far as what that job will be classified as um, in, in their division. So there's um, a couple different codes that can be used, student one to student four. Um, job classifications that just uh, essentially tie into the type or the nature of the work that the student is doing for the organization, which will be important for payroll purposes as well. The last one on here, which is really critical to ensuring that the Learning Aligned Employment Program is able to cover um, the full cost share for a student is to have the supervisor provide the correct position pool ID of R to the HR admin team or for our folks that maybe are in the room that are on their HR admin team, using that position pool ID of R in order to have uh, the student set up in order to have late cover their wages. What that position pool ID of R is, is when that is input into UC Path or payroll systems, it will allow the wages that would have otherwise been charged to the department to instead be routed to the late program up to the student's allocation. That's essentially the way that the, 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 the code is set up. Um, the systems essentially will see the student's allocation and continue to divert wages up until they earn that amount to our account. Um, and then if the student um, or employer, I should say, chooses to employ the student past their allocation, they can most certainly do so, but then it will, you know, start routing back to the department. So that position pool ID of R um, is really critical for our on-campus department supervisors to provide to their HR or admin team um, or for the HR or admin team to really just know about it. So again, can be done at the same time as the uh, documents uh, that we just saw in the last couple of slides, but all of it should be kind of squared away before a student starts um, working under leave. On this next slide here, um, I just wanna kind of provide a, a recap of the information that we've shared so far for onboarding since it's a couple of different steps on here. This is more so a representation as far as the workflow process is, is concerned. So again, let's say you have a student that you are ready, ready to hire. Um, the student would kick off the process in completing that work study new hire form, providing information about their supervisor, whether or not they have the job posting. And based on their responses, they'll get the student employment contract and be the first ones to sign off on that. Once they sign off on the student employment contract, um, it'll then be routed. And I think the next click, Michelle, is maybe the little arrow showcasing that. Um, but I'll then route to the supervisor to complete their portion of the student employment contract. At the same time, or maybe right after the student employment contract, is when the supervisor will want to ensure that department admin um, or shared service centers are involved in order to onboard the student um, in payroll systems using the correct position pool ID of R. So again, that's absolutely critical. In general though, if supervisors want to start including their HR or admin team in these conversations when they're planning to hire a student, I think that um, would, would even be strongly encouraged early on our end. All right, so um, something to keep in mind when onboarding a student as well, or when you have completed um, all the onboarding steps is to make sure that folks are aware of the employment timelines for this current academic year. Um, and you know, future academic years as well, but here's are just the ones up until the end of this academic year or this late eligibility period. Right now we're currently in winter quarter and because classes are in session, students do have uh, the limit of 19 hours um, a week to work under the late program. So there's no minimum hours per se, but 19 is again, that student employment guideline. Once we uh, wrap up with winter quarter, we'll hit spring break. And since classes are not in session at that point, the student can work up to 39 hours a week under late. After that, we will start back up again with spring quarter. And since classes will resume, then that 19 hours per week guideline also resumes as well. And up and around May 15th is when will be the last day to start uh, to stop posting those late positions in Handshake. So just keeping in mind, you know, the, the different paperwork that's involved and the um, payroll processes that need to be set up, May 15th kind of ensures that 
folks will still be able to start to use at least some of the funding before the late eligibility period ends on June 22nd, 2024, um, which is the end of the spring quarter. And our academic years run until the, the spring being our last quarter. So that's also when late eligibility would um, close as well, since students' eligibility is determined on a year-to-year -year basis based on that financial aid application. And the last really step of, of this process or things that folks will, will want to do as a part of the, the late program is to make sure that folks are having their uh, students hours monitored, making sure that they're keeping track of how many hours a student still has remaining to work under late. Um, we provide a starting point for folks through the late student employment contract in that when the supervisor goes ahead and inputs the student's allocation based on the work study eligibility notification and the hourly rate that they're paying the student, the contract will calculate how many hours under late they are anticipated to be able to work. And it really comes directly from taking that work city um, allocation amount and dividing that by the number of hours, um, or, sorry, not the number of hours, the pay rate for the student that will determine the, the resulting hours. So here's kind of a screenshot on the right of what that looks like in the actual contract. But as an example for folks, let's say the student has $3,000 in a, a late allocation that's listed on their work study eligibility notification. If a student has a pay rate of $16 per hour, and we just divide those two numbers, so 3,000 um, of an allocation divided by 16 of an hourly rate, um, that would be about 187 hours the student has to work under late. And so that doesn't need to be split up on an even week to week basis. Um, so long as you know the student's not going over 19 hours, they can work less than that. Um, Supervisors do essentially have the discretion of working with their student to see what kind of schedule best fits their, their uh, project needs as well. But in this particular example, let's say they had those 187 hours to work. If they're having them work um, up to those 19 hours per week every week, uh, then the late allocation would be depleted after about nine weeks, let's say. But of course, as um, Michelle from the Career Center mentioned earlier in the presentation, you do want to make sure that you check with your student in the case that they are working more than one late job. Um, or, yeah, more than one late job or more than one on-campus employment job, I should say more generally, just because there is that 19 hour um, per week student employment guideline, no matter where or how many jobs they're working on campus in consideration of their, their unit load, essentially. And to kind of wrap up this section, um, I just do want to go back into the differences between the federal work city and the learning aligned employment program, um, just because there might be certain positions that are better for one program versus the other just based on folks needs. Um, and both our office and the career center will help folks figure out where um, to, to best classify the position. Um, but first and foremost, in this comparison, the types of jobs are really uh, the, one of the biggest differences between the federal work city and learning aligned employment program with federal work city having a broader range of the types of roles that it can support. Um, so more things that are clerical or administrative or fashion or things that are helping the agency as opposed to, to the community as a whole. Um, and the learning aligned employment program for our on-campus departments more specifically, um, they have to be research-based. So at least 51% or more research-based in order to qualify for the cost share that we'll go into here. Now the cost share for the federal work study program for most um, standard or traditional types of work study jobs, uh, the cost share is 65% um, being covered by the federal work study program and 35% by the department. Um, there are gonna be some classifications that do qualify under a different type of federal work study, which is a community service-based role. That one does have a little bit of a higher cost share at about 75% with the department covering 25%. Um, with the Learning Aligned Employment Program, since it does have that specific research-based designation, um, the program is able to cover 100% of a student's wages up to their allocation. Um, now, just a little asterisk on either of these cost shares. Um, so the late program covers the student wages directly, but it doesn't cover things like shift differential or fringe benefits. Um, so we do recommend that in order to you know, avoid those additional costs to have a student schedule somewhere between eight to five, uh, where it's just normal standard you know, traditional hours. In terms of the eligibility period for federal work study, um, for this program um, operates from fall through spring, as is a learning aligned employment program, um, but sometimes there's a bit more flexibility in order to provide uh, late funding in the summer. We did have some folks participate this past summer 
um, under the, the Learning Aligned Employment Program. However, um, we are still kind of to be determined on this next upcoming summer, just because we've recently received information from federal student aid in regard to when we will receive um, information about students eligibility for next year due to some of the changes um, from the, the new FAFSA simplification essentially that's, that's going on. Um, so just depending on what we're able to work out there, we'll make sure to uh, post it online to see if we're able to do summer. But for now, uh, that's to be determined um, for sure to be able to start up back in fall. And lastly on here for federal work study, students are directly eligible for the program if they have the work study award on their financial aid award offer. Uh, that's going to be similar to the Learning Aligned Employment Program as well, but one thing that I do want to mention is there's going to be some students that maybe do not have it posted on the award, and for the 23-24 academic year, there might be some other exceptions or populations that we can consider eligible for the program, even if they don't have that work study eligibility. And so if there are other students that may be different supervisors or employers are already working with that maybe don't fit the bill for traditional work city programs, um, but would like to be reviewed to see if they're late eligible through any of those exceptions, uh, we definitely welcome it. Um, and I have the email on there that students can um, have their eligibility reviewed for the late program more specifically. Lastly, with student eligibility, again, these particular positions with late do have to ensure that they're providing educational opportunities that will help students um, with future career path, paths and goals. And that'll be something that the student will need to self-certify for as well. That's really kind of an overview in the program. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Michelle to just share some um, of the resources that we've been working on so far. Great. All right, so um, we've actually done quite a bit um, since we started the program to really just put um, as much information as we can on the website and create some new resources. So hopefully this will be helpful to you. Uh, we've just updated our website. Um, so uh, we'll, again, you can access it via this QR code um, and we'll also do a follow-up email um, to you get the exact link to where that is. But you'll notice on the website, um, all of the eligibility information we discussed and qualifications, uh, parameters, cost share splits, all of that's included here. We have some other resources um, that are good for both those hiring managers as well as the admins that would be supporting uh, the hiring process. Um, so again, just really encourage you all to take advantage of that. And we also have a recording for this info, info session um, on our website. We'll probably update it with this version um, here soon. Um, so just wanted to let you all know that that is there for you. Um, and then some of those resources that are also on our website, there's kind of an overview guide for our faculty and staff. So if some of you are working with other colleagues um, that might be interested in the program and you just want to give them a high level quick quick fact sheet this is going to be your resource here um this resource um on how to hire a late student really just outlines again in a, a one-page format um the process um you know starting from the hiring process through uh the on onboarding and monitoring student work hours Um, this is the late job posting guide that I referenced. And um, again, in here, we'll give you kind of a sample job description, break out the details of the form and what um, areas need to be updated. So again, hopefully um, you all can get it right the first time and we don't have to go back and forth. Um, and then this is a really great resource uh, for those department admins that are supporting the onboarding process gives a quick guide on, on the steps that are needed just to make sure that, um, oh, I'm sorry, Michelle, I took yours. So why don't no you worries. speak to this piece? <laughs> yeah, no, so that's a pretty good summary of the, the onboarding FAQs on there. Um, we had typically before been uh, providing this to, to employers and folks that we've been working with um, kind of via email in, in some of our meetings, but we, I believe, Michelle, if I'm not mistaken, um, currently have this posted to our website. So folks can kind of see uh, the, the onboarding side of it a little bit maybe earlier than they've been able to in the past before. It kind of starts off with just an overview of hiring students so folks can orient themselves as far as, you know, what they should be doing when onboarding kind of comes in and who to, who to speak with uh, to get some assistance on these steps. 
and it provides some of the frequently asked questions that we've gotten so far from folks going through the onboarding process for late. Um, so it has um, a bit more explanations on things like the position pool ID if folks are not directly working with those types of items, right? How to explain that to uh, maybe the HR and admin team, um, how payments work, th things like that. So um, that's what the onboarding FAQs are and I'm very excited that they're on the website now. And I think we have a couple more resources after this. Yeah, so um, uh, after those items, we do also have a late information form. So it's a Microsoft form that folks can fill out to um, interact with our late team and provide us information about what stage they are in uh, being a part of the, the Learning Aligned Employment Program. And based on the answers to their questions on there, they'll receive customized support to be able to provide information on the stage that they're in and looking forward to you know, the next step after that. Um, and folks can also uh, meet with our late team in order to uh, really just have a one-on-one -on -one with what stage they are in the process as well, whether that be maybe more on the handshake side of things or really trying to you know, onboard a student. So that's definitely an option. Um, and then the last thing on this particular slide is the late marketing toolkit that has been built out um, in order to start to advertise late on different channels if your department is interested, um, but also to provide folks with more information on what the program is itself. Uh, we do have those uh, materials available at this point in time. And lastly, we just wanted to close out with our contact information. Um, as you can kind of see through the webinar, there's some things that more are oriented towards the career center side of things and things that are more housed within financial aid. Um, so here's just maybe a couple topics as far as who to contact in these uh, particular situations and then our respective emails as well. Normally we do get kind of CC'd on the same things as well, so I'm more than happy to jump on any uh, shared email thread or, or channel there. And with that being said, thank you all so much for attending this webinar today. I think we do have some time here to uh, start answering those questions as well. So I will kind of pull those up. Yeah, I'm happy to um, read them off and then we'll see who's uh, the best to answer. Um, I wanted to start with Amanda's question. Um, when the student um, exhausts their award, what are their options? Do you feel like you got your questions answered on that or... Is there anything where you wanted to know? Well, we we did have a student that exhausted their allocation this last year, and um, we we just emailed, you know, the emailed Michelle and asked her about whether it was able to be increased. But I don't know if that's the appropriate way to do it. Like, if I if somebody here at our department asked us what's the proper you know process to do that, I I just thought we should get some guidance about what's the appropriate way to do that did we do it correctly gotcha. what yeah, what if what if what if what if it's exhausted and we didn't want to make a request if we want the department to just go ahead and start paying well, how can we do that in advance so it would just uh so the coa just changes how can we do that in advance michelle i can help with this if you'd like as well yeah. Um, so with that being said, I, at the moment, um, either the supervisor going ahead and emailing us to explore any uh, potential increases is, is perfectly fine at the moment. Uh, the student can also do it on their end as well um, through the same process as uh, emailing. We are working towards trying to uh, build out something more where maybe the student can increase it there on, um, on their end via their financial aid portal. Um, but we don't have that quite in the moment. So yes, emailing us is perfectly fine um, for those cases in which maybe a student's allocation is uh, going to be depleted. And we'll review to see if that's possible based on their financial aid award um, as well. Um, but separately, you know, if, if the department just wants to, or, or maybe there, there's no room to be able to increase the award, let's say the department just wants to move forward with being able to uh, continue to have the student working and just pay out of departmental funds. Um, when the when the work study or the late allocation is depleted, that's essentially what would work as behind the scenes. That position pool idea of R would no longer be working because it's not tied to those uh, to that funding anymore. So the the COA would be or the the chart of accounts would be defaulted to the departments um, to the departments, and it would essentially work in that way. Once the funding is depleted, then those charges are already diverted to the department. Hopefully that answered your question. Or Monica, add on. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think just maybe ensuring that um, already because the home department is the one who is hiring and onboarding the student, then you're already, when you're doing that, you're putting your uh, COA on there. The position pool ID is the trigger that will actually make it charge the LAPE account and the LAPE fund. So you would then, you know, through that process, be using LAPE funding to pay for the student wages. And then once the funding runs out on the individual student level, um, then it just charges your normal uh, COA um, account, your, your normal salary account, wherever you have that uh, typically set up. So the, the position pool ID is critical to make sure that the late funding is used, but again, it's already built in the system that once it is uh, exhausted, then it just charges your normal account that you would have used to uh, onboard the student originally. Awesome. All right, and I'm gonna go in the um, order here that I have of our questions. So um, there was a question from Macy about um, how many departments or faculty have taken advantage of the program since the launch? If there's any information on that. So um, I do have some, some information from that. I kind of pulled it up as we were kind of going, going along for this particular question, uh, but we have about uh, 20 faculty members. So individual faculty members that are currently participating in the late program. Um, with a variety of different uh, number of students. So one of the things that we didn't quite cover, but we do sometimes, you know, get the question um, posed to us is, well, how many students can um, a LAPE employer supervise? Like how many LAPE students can be at one particular department? Um, and while there isn't necessarily a limit, um, we more so kind of frame it in terms of, well, how many students can you supervise in terms of making sure you're monitoring their hours, right? Making sure that you're supervising them as, as any other employer would. Um, so there's not quite a, a limit to um, the number of students at a location. Um, so right now, 20 employers with variety number of students. And some have come back more than once mm -hmm. um, to post as well. Yeah, but we definitely are um, continuing to try to expand our outreach, you know, hence even doing this info session, um, you know, as part of that. And then... Um, relying on partners like yourself to help us spread the word. Uh, thank you, Michelle and Michelle. Uh, was this a follow-up? Uh, what is, uh, I guess, do you have a goal of how many faculty you would love to participate at the end of the year? You know, I, I'm just personally curious to, to see if you all have a number or goal of how many faculty um, would represent success for you. I feel like it, as a team, we haven't come together to have a specific defined number because it, the late program is so relatively in its early stages. So it's hard to gauge what that quite looks like. So as far as implementation for the program, we started about spring quarter um, last academic year and um, being able to, to work with employers to, to have students utilize the, the funding. So this is really the first full year that we're going ahead and implementing the program. Um, my mind often just wants to say like 100 because it's a clean number, but I think we're still kind of determining what everybody's capacity looks like as well. I don't think we have a defined one, but we would love for more at this point. So that's kind of where I stand. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I think we would love for more, but I also feel like for our pilot year, um, feeling good. A lot of this year has been really rolling out the process and streamlining things, getting our communication channels, all of those things figured out. So hopeful that we'll continue to see those numbers increase. Um, all right, so uh, there was also a question about are any UCR departments making LAPE a requirement? Not that I know of at None this point in time. None that I'm aware, yep. All right, uh, can the LAPE opportunity be combined? This one's from Sonia. Uh, can the LAPE opportunity be combined with unpaid credit-bearing internships to produce a paid on-campus opportunity? Yeah, so the answer to that is definitely yes. Um, it's in fact encouraged by the California Student Aid Commission uh, to see if any sort of LAPE opportunity can also be counted for academic credit. 
um, in terms of, you know, showcasing that that is a learning aligned, you know, experience that would kind of fit the bill. So yes, um, it can definitely fit with um, some sort of program or unpaid internship program that um, is research-based if it's an on-campus location, of course. So answer definitely yes to that one. Can I tag on one question to that as well, too, because um, here in art history, we're a very small department, of course, and so we offer a credit-bearing undergraduate internship, but it's unpaid. And I would love to be able to convert that for students into a paid opportunity that's both credit bearing and, but uh, I'm a little unclear and that's just because I haven't done this before. What are some of the sort of fringe benefit costs that could be attached to this? Um, because I need to be wary of that or is it truly fully funded as long as we're eight to five Monday through Friday? Gotcha. So, um... Well, if we're talking about eight to five, Monday to Friday, then shift differentials would kind of be um, outside of that. But um, it would be things like uh, if locations provided like sick leave, um, uh, vacation leave, usually student employment doesn't include that. But let's say like sick leave, those outside other benefits that employers are providing to students. I believe different divisions should have their kind of list of what's provided for their student um, employees. But like the mm -hmm. biggest one would be sick leave. Um, Students normally shouldn't be accruing sick leave Unless just because they're, they're working. Uh -huh. So yeah. um, I would check with the, your particular department to see for your student roles if um, you have all had them in the past. Um, your HR admin team should be able to know what um, fringe benefits might be kind of playing basically based on what the student is performing in, in your department or for your program, let's say. Um, okay. Most of them don't apply, but shift differentials are the most common form really. Okay, so if we shy away from that, and if we keep a student, I mean, obviously within the 19 hours, well under the 19 hours, we should be okay, but it's worth right. just checking with our FAO, yeah? Yes, definitely worth checking with FAO, but yeah, typically the most standard will incur those type of fringe benefits. Okay, I one last question. Also, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead, please go ahead. I, I was just going to add, there might be some onboarding costs, so if there's any like fingerprinting or um, anything that might need to happen throughout the onboarding process, even if they're being, um, you know, onboarded a certain way, that might be a little bit of a charge. I think mm -hmm. even um, volunteering, so onboarding someone as a volunteer, there might yeah. be a little bit of a cost uh, related to it. But I think as long as we can show that this internship is also doing research yeah. um, to be able to fit perfectly with the requirements, then it could work. How quickly, if you want to get something up and running for spring, how quickly do we need to get it in front of you for approval? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, the first step is going to be that job posting. Um, and then if you already have a list of students that you know are going to be participating in the course, because it's tied to an academic course, correct? Did I hear that correctly? It's an academic internship. So academic um, internship. it's usually, I usually host one or two a year at the yeah. most. Yeah, so once you kind of have that list of uh, students, you could share that with um, the Michelle here in financial aid, um, and she would be able to check their eligibility for the program. I think I meant making sure that my internship description, me, and I, I, I mean, I think I, I meet this fully. I think it's like a great, a fantastic fit, but I need to get it in front of you guys as well to make sure it is. So how quickly yeah. do I need to do that? Do you just need a day, a couple of days, a week? Can I email you later today? Yeah, email, kind of me, yeah. email me and we should be able to get back to you, I think, within the week. Um, awesome. Okay. Yeah. We'll do. Thank you so much. Absolutely. All right, um, next question. Um, is there any data on how many undergraduate research positions on campus that are currently unpaid? And I think Macy might have dropped off the call. So um, I'm gonna skip to the next one. <laughs> uh, what if a student remains um, employed by our department for the next academic year? Do we need to hire them all over again? That is a good question. Um, so there is, because uh, for this program specifically, um, again, financial aid is awarded on a year-to-year -year basis, um, there is a process on our end where we would need to, again, have that job posting posted for the new academic year under those new uh, timeline. Um, and it would be, again, they would just add reserved into the title so we know that it doesn't go live. And then they would complete that work study new hire form to kick off the hiring process on our end. But if you are, um, you know, from your department have already 
hired them that it you could do um, a short work break and then kind of bring them back into the following year. So it's just a matter of that documentation again. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Got it. You should. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. I think we got through all the questions um, and I know we're at time, but if there's anybody else that has any quick questions, happy to stay on for a little bit more, but want to be mindful of time and let those who need to go to lunch, enjoy that. But thank you all for joining us today. And, you know, we do hope that we get to work with you more closely in the future.